The Marshfield Pioneer Cemetery is the Coos Bay region's oldest extant burying ground with a period of active use from the 1880s until the 1920s. It's the final resting place for about 2,000 people who shaped the region during this key period in our local history. Let's begin by orienting ourselves to the cemetery's location in comparison to Marshfield using this 1910 map. Marshfield, today the city of Coos Bay, was incorporated as a city in 1874, and much of the original development was oriented along the waterfront. As the community grew, adjoining areas, which were low-lying and quite marshy, were filled in to become today's downtown. Logically, it wouldn't make sense to locate a cemetery in a boggy area frequently affected by tidal flooding. Additionally, in the 19th century, many people had concerns about what they often called miasmas, or bad air, and it was quite typical to locate a cemetery a short distance away from the community's downtown, where it was still convenient to access, but slightly removed from urban homes and businesses. The area of South Marshfield, where the cemetery is located, was a part of the city platted later than downtown and known as the Railroad Edition. Much of the Railroad Edition was owned by a gentleman named Charles H. Merchant. Merchant came to the Coos Bay region to work for the Simpson Lumber Company as a bookkeeper, and he quickly set himself up as a key local businessman and as an important property owner. Thus, Merchant was often honored with the title Father of Marshfield for his role in shaping the region and his extensive property holdings. Merchant and his wife Mary had a large family, as was typical of the 19th century, and was also typical, a number of their children died in infancy or early childhood. In 1878, their three-year-old daughter, Ella Rose Merchant, died of unknown causes, most likely childhood disease or illness. Merchant took some of the property that he owned in the railroad edition and set it aside as a small private cemetery. It's likely that Ella Rose was the first person interred in what would eventually become today's Marshfield Pioneer Cemetery. For approximately 10 years, the Merchant family used the area as a small private cemetery and several other merchant children were interred alongside their sister. In 1878, Merchant was approached by the local lodge of the Independent Order of Oddfellows about providing land for a new public cemetery. The Oddfellows, or the IOOF, were an important fraternal organization in 19th and early 20th century America, with the first lodge in the U.S. established in 1819. Today, we're much more familiar with other fraternal organizations like the Masons, the Elks, and the Eagles, but in 19th century Coos Bay, the Oddfellows actually had a significantly larger membership than any of the other fraternal groups. In 1907, Sunset Lodge No. 51, the local Marshfield branch, had about 180 male members plus a large women's auxiliary. The Oddfellows were concerned, as were many fraternal groups at the time, with caring for their members and providing services to the wider community. In particular, the Oddfellows focused on providing after-death care, establishing cemeteries, covering the costs of funerals for members, and caring for deceased members, widows, and orphans. The Oddfellows also provided affordable cemetery lots to non-members. In many small cities and towns, particularly in rural places like Oregon, the local Oddfellows Cemetery might serve as the primary public burying ground in the region. For instance, in Coos County, we have six cemeteries established by different Oddfellow Lodges. And across Oregon, there are 116 Oddfellow Cemeteries. With this clear precedent, the local Marshfield Lodge reached out to Charles Merchant in 1888 about purchasing eight acres of property including the area that Merchant had been using as a family burying ground. Merchant sold it to them for $350, a very affordable price for the time, and a pretty good deal for the Oddfellows. The Oddfellows would turn around about two decades later and sell half of that property, four acres, for about $12,000. This was the first platted map of the cemetery, redrawn in about 1921, but based on an earlier map that was probably drawn in the early 20th century. The Oddfellows took half their eight acres of property and laid it out as a cemetery, mostly in groups of 16 lots making up a block. C.H. Merchant reserved the center section of the cemetery, where he had buried his daughter and where he himself will later go on to be buried, as C.H. Merchant's reserve. It's a private family plot to this day, 
and if you visit the cemetery, it's a section of the middle with chain-link fencing around it, which is put up by relatives after some incidents of vandalism in the 20th century. The first person officially buried in the cemetery once it opens is a man named Thomas Hilborn, who died in June of 1888. As you can see, this is one of about 340 gravestones in the cemetery in need of some level of repair. And Thomas Hilborn is interesting if for no other reason than that he came from Maine, quite a distance in the 19th century. How does someone from Maine end up in Coos Bay? If we start looking at data compiled from the cemetery's records, we see that people interred in the Marshall Pioneer Cemetery are remarkably diverse. People from 44 different states and 22 countries are buried there. And Thomas Hilborn was one of 31 people hailing from Maine, most of whom were involved in shipbuilding or other industries. When the Oddfellows Cemetery Corporation establishes the cemetery in 1888, they're going to start selling deeds, officially selling lots to community members who need them. While the Oddfellows were intent on providing a service to the community, Plots weren't free, you weren't going to get something for nothing, but they were priced affordably. If we look at the numbers, lots seem to have sold on a sliding scale, perhaps based on one's economic situation. Overall, however, lots seem to sell for about $8.50 per plot, which works out to be about $280 in today's money, which gives us a clear sense that for the Odd Fellows, running a cemetery was about providing a service, not generating revenue. This deed, for Emma Rook's purchase of four lots, shows that she only paid $19 total, a little bit less than the standard pricing for cemetery lots. In addition to selling deeds, the Odd Fellows also start recording information. A bit unfortunately, there's a lag between when they start selling plots in 1888 and when they start recording burials in these dual entry logbooks in about 1890 or 1891. This is block 75 and 76 in the cemetery logbook. And we can see that it's divided into two sections. The top half has information that would be recorded in a deed. Who bought the plot, what the deed number was, and when the deed was bought. The bottom half has information about the people interred in each of those 16 plots. Information like name, place of birth, age, cause of death, and date of burial. Over 2,000 people were buried in the cemetery and recorded in these logbooks be between its starting date of 1888 and the 1920s when it was really supplanted by Sunset Memorial Park. Out of the approximately 2,000 lots in the cemetery, only 58 were left unsold. There wasn't much additional room at the cemetery. It was full. So in the 1920s, the local Oddfellows established Sunset Memorial Park as their new regional burying ground. Many people, particularly those who didn't have close family members interred at the Marshfield IOF Cemetery, moved on and ceased to think too much about this part of our local history. If we peruse the cemetery's gravestones, we will see some familiar names that we might still recognize today. Many of the early business leaders of Marshfield and the namesakes of our streets today were buried in the cemetery. So for instance, Anderson Avenue in downtown Coos Bay is named for E.A. Anderson, the owner of a Marshfield livery stable and the first mayor of the city of Marshfield. Just a few blocks away, Johnson Avenue was named for Charles Johnson, who ran a furniture store and was the first president of the Oddfellows Cemetery Corporation. There are important people buried in the cemetery whose history is still remembered through local landmarks today. But more of the 2,000 people in the cemetery have been forgotten. Despite their overlooked status today, they're really people we should know. Many of them have interesting histories that are worth untangling and remembering. But telling these stories can be hard to do, and if we're dependent on their gravestones or the scant amount of information preserved in the cemetery logbook, we're not really going to learn much about them. However, if we take the time to delve into a variety of local history resources, we can begin to tell these micro-histories of the Coos Bay region. Let's begin chronologically with Elizabeth Hudson West. The front of her headstone has virtually no information about her, just the inscription, Mother. And the back of it is only slightly more informative with her death date, age, and name. 
depended on her gravestone as the only source of information, we likely wouldn't be able to tell much of her history. Thankfully, a fair amount of research was done on her husband, Calvin West, in the 20th century, and this book written about him in 1961, titled Calvin B. West of the Umpqua, is an important record today. The volume is essentially a compilation of primary source materials, including West's diaries and family letters. So Elizabeth Hudson marries her husband, Calvin Benjamin West, in 1842 in Ohio. Like most couples of the time, they had a number of children in quick succession, and Elizabeth will have five children within a decade. Now Calvin, theoretically, is a farmer in Ohio, but he has a bit of an itchy foot, a bit of wanderlust, and he feels called by God to be a missionary. Elizabeth West's older brother, John, had actually already immigrated west to Oregon, and he writes home in the early 1850s, telling the family about the economic opportunities in Oregon and the need for Christian missionaries to minister to new European settlers in the region. After hearing about the wonders of Oregon, Calvin decides that his future is out west. At the time, he doesn't have the money to pack up his whole family and take them west. So what does he do? He leaves Elizabeth, along with their five children, all under the age of 10, alone at home in Ohio while he goes to Oregon. From their home in northwest Ohio, he goes south to Cincinnati on the Ohio River, then travels down the Ohio River and up the Mississippi River to St. Louis. From St. Louis, he crosses the state of Missouri and travels to St. Joseph on the western edge of the state, which was a common jumping off point for the Oregon Trail. He crosses the Oregon Trail with the 1853 wagon train, reaches the Willamette Valley, and goes south to the Umpqua Valley, southwest of today's city of Eugene. Calvin stakes a donation land claim, getting 360 acres of free land from the government. He spends the next 18 months preaching as a Baptist minister and teaching at a subscription school in the region. Then he gets a letter that his wife is gravely ill. His family back in Ohio don't think that Elizabeth will survive a bout with pneumonia, and they write to Calvin telling him to come back to Ohio, not necessarily for Elizabeth's benefit, but because he will soon have five children who will be orphaned. Calvin returns to Ohio by reversing his journey. So he travels north to Portland, takes a steamer from Portland south to San Francisco. From San Francisco, he takes another ship south to the Isthmus of Panama, crosses the Isthmus of Panama, and then boards a third ship that takes him north to New Orleans. From Louisiana, it's up the Mississippi River and up the Ohio River until he reaches his home in northwestern Ohio. On his return home, he finds that Elizabeth has recovered, and almost immediately, he begins planning a return to Oregon, this time with his entire family. They're unable to sell the farm, and finances are tight, but Calvin is determined. The family heads east to New York City, where they get a ship from New York Harbor. The family is so poor at this point that they can't afford a cabin and are traveling steerage. Fortunately, the captain is moved by their plight and Calvin's status as a Baptist missionary, and he offers them a cabin a few days into the journey. The ship from New York takes them to the Isthmus of Panama, where there is not yet a Panama Canal, and where they have to cross this potentially dangerous, illness-ridden jungle. When the West reboard a new ship, the Sierra Nevada, on the western side of the Isthmus, some passengers come aboard with cholera, a highly contagious, waterborne bacterial disease. The ship is about three days out from the Isthmus when Calvin, who's been ministering to some of the people who have already fallen ill, catches cholera himself. Within 24 hours, he's dead and buried at sea. Several days later, the newly widowed Elizabeth arrives at the port of San Francisco with five children under the age of 10 and no resources. She is able to get a lot of help from the Baptist community in San Francisco, who are touched by her tragic story. Deciding that there's nothing left for her in Ohio, Elizabeth decides to journey on to Oregon and see what kind of life she can make for herself there. So she and her children go north to Portland by steamer and then by wagon 
down to the Umpqua Valley. Calvin had assured her that a home had been built for the family on his donation land claim, but Elizabeth finds an unfinished foundation in a very isolated region. Deciding that she cannot support her children alone in the wilderness, she instead purchases property in Wilbur, an area that is just north of present-day Roseburg. Here, in the 1860 census, Elizabeth West is listed without an occupation, fairly typical of the gender bias of the 19th century. But she did have an occupation. She had to to support her five children, and her choice of property in Wilbur was very deliberate. Later in life, her eldest daughter, Anne Augusta, recalled her mother's travails in those early years in Oregon. Mrs. West decided to cast her lot among these people, being at heart a Methodist, build here a home, board pupils for a living, and educate her children. She bought a lot among the beautiful oaks at a convenient distance from the schoolhouse upon which to erect her little house. The one carpenter of the country whom she employed was assisted by nearly all the able-bodied men of the neighborhood who volunteered to help build Sister West's house. When Mrs. West became nicely settled in her new home, her family enlarged by half a dozen boarders for the school. She bravely faced the situation, literally rolled up her sleeves, and went cheerfully to work. With the income from the boarders, Elizabeth's able to support herself and her family. Her proudest achievement was that, despite her financial hardships, she was able to educate all five of her children and saw to it that her daughters married into prosperous families, ensuring that they'll have a more secure life than she herself did. In the last years of her life, she moves west from Wilbur to Marshville. Her youngest daughter, Sarah Abigail, who was just a baby when they came to Oregon in 1855, had married a dentist in the city of Marshville. Elizabeth came to live with the couple, and she died in Marshville in 1882. The year before, in 1881, her young granddaughter, a baby named Della, died, and the two were interred together. As their deaths predate the Marshfield IOOF Cemetery, it's unclear where they were buried initially, but in about 1915, the family had their bodies disinterred and reburied in their current location, side by side in the Marshfield Cemetery. Elizabeth West certainly wasn't the only woman in her era who faced a lot of struggles. Women, particularly widowed or single women, could have a lot of challenges in making a life for themselves. But other groups, like immigrants to the U.S., often had equally different lives. In the late 1800s, many people arriving in the Coos Bay region were recent immigrants, particularly from northern and western Europe, seeking new opportunities in the area's shipyards, logging camps, and coal mines. Finland, part of the Russian Empire at the time, actually saw its population decline by 10% because over 200,000 Finnish men left the country between 1880 and 1914. This man, John or Johann Lati, was one of those men. Like a small number of other immigrants buried in the cemetery, Lati's gravestone is in his native Finnish rather than English. If we look at a translation, we see that this is a joint gravestone for John and his infant son, Oscar, who both die in 1897. To begin learning more about this family, one good place to start is with an obituary in the local newspaper. Here, in November of 1897, is what the Myrtle Point Enterprise wrote about Lottie's death. John Leite was killed accidentally at Beaver Hill Mine on Monday last week. He had finished his day's work in the mine and was getting into the car with four companions at the foot of the slope. Owing to some misunderstanding of the signals, the car was started up and Letty was thrown in front of it and dragged some 40 feet before the car could be stopped. He was killed instantly. Deceased was 32 years of age and leaves a wife and three children. He came to this place from Rock Springs, Wyoming about two months ago. The funeral was held in Marshfield on Wednesday interment in Oddfellow Cemetery. So it's hard to know exactly, but we might infer that one of the causes contributing to Lottie's unfortunate death was a miscommunication. This might be in part because he, along with many of the other people working as coal miners at Beaver Hill, were not necessarily native speakers of English. <laughs> 
Lati would have been working alongside Welsh and Italian miners, all of whom spoke English with different accents. The obituary also notes that John leaves behind a wife and three children. A little more research into Finnish church records reveals that the Lati family is the 19th century equivalent of what we might call a blended family today. John's first wife, with whom he had immigrated from Finland in 1889, died in 1894 while they were living in Rock Springs, where he had also worked in the mining industry. The death of his wife from typhoid left him with two young children to care for, and he was remarried within six months to his second wife, Matilda. By the time of John's death in 1897, he had fathered five children between his two wives, and only three of the children were still living. By the end of the year, Matilda's youngest biological child, Oscar, would be dead as well. If we look at the cemetery logbook for Block 32, we see the information recorded about John, including the fact that the cause of his death was an accident. One plot above him is another Finnish miner, Sylvester Koski, who also dies in an accident almost eight years to the day later. Incidentally, John's widow Matilda married Sylvester Koski after her first husband's untimely death. Unfortunately for her, coal miners had a fairly high mortality rate. If we take just a step back for a minute from the Lati and Koski families, we can see that accidents are highlighted here in green on this graph. About 7% of people buried in the cemetery died in accidents, the third most common cause of death overall. There were lots of hazards in the 19th century that left women widowed, and many of them, particularly immigrant women who didn't speak fluent English, found themselves in precarious straits after their husbands' accidental deaths. The sad story of Matilda Lati actually continues on after her second husband's death. Her last child is born about six months after Sylvester's death in 1906. At least some of her children and her stepchildren are fostered out to other families. Matilda seems to have suffered from postpartum depression, and her sanity was examined on several occasions by the local authorities. After several examinations and charges that Matilda was dangerous to both herself and her children, as well as that she'd been damaging local residences, she was eventually sent to the Oregon State Insane Asylum in Salem. It seems that she spent the last years of her life as an inmate and patient there. The Lati family story certainly doesn't have a happy ending. Like so many immigrants, they came to America in search of a better life, and their dreams and aspirations often fell short of reality. Immigrants, however, weren't the only people seeking new opportunities in the Coos Bay region. Many native-born Americans were drawn west by the lure of prosperity in the Pacific Northwest and the hope of a better life for themselves and their children. One person who followed this route to the Coos Bay region was a Civil War veteran named Barry Vineyard. Today, there are upwards of 60 Civil War veterans buried in the Marshfield Pioneer Cemetery. Most of them are Union veterans, but a small group, including Barry, served with the Confederate States of America. He enlisted in 1861 when he's a teenager, enlisting in the 2nd Regiment of the Mississippi Volunteer Infantry. And Company I, his company, has one of the great nicknames of the war, called the Plenitude Invincibles. When Barry Vineyard enlists, it's for a 12-month term beginning in August of 1861. And in 1862, in February of 1862, he has the bad luck to be stationed at Fort Donelson. For Civil War buffs, Fort Donelson is a fort on the Cumberland River in Tennessee, primarily remembered today as the battle where Lieutenant General Ulysses Grant began to rise in prominence. Union forces attacked this Confederate-held fort, and most of the Confederate soldiers staffing it are taken prisoner. Barry Vineyard is one of those his whole unit is pretty much captured, and they're sent north to Camp Douglas, a POW camp outside of Chicago in Illinois. Today, Andersonville Prison in Georgia has a reputation as one of the most infamous of the Confederate's POW camps. But essentially, most camps, north or south, were squalid, horrible places with high mortality. Barry Vineyard was at Camp Douglas for about seven months, and then 
Because at this point in the war, the Union and Confederate armies are still conducting prisoner exchanges, Barry is eventually exchanged and sent to Vicksburg in September of 1862. While his Civil War records tell us a bit about his military service, we don't really know much about Barry's life afterwards. We know that he moved around for a bit, living at various places in the Upper South and Midwest. Barry supports his family primarily as a farmer, and he eventually ends up in Indian Territory, at the time simply called IT, but which we know today as part of the state of Oklahoma. The 1890s were not a good time to be a farmer in Indian Territory. There had been a number of droughts that led to crop failures, and most farmers were struggling to get by. In 1897, a group of local residents in his area decide that they're going to try their luck out west. One of them has received a promotional brochure about how great it is in Oregon, with steady rainfall and rich soils in the Willamette Valley, two things greatly lacking in Indian Territory. Barry Vineyard decides to join this small group, and fortunately, he travels west with a young man named Walter Weaver, who will eventually marry Barry's daughter and become his son-in-law. In the 1940s, descendants ask elderly Walter to write his memoirs about his early life and the 1897 trip to Oregon. So we're extremely lucky to have a first-hand account of the journey and regular references to Barry. One of the impressions that we get from Walter's account is of Barry Vineyard as a steady and unflappable man, just the type of person you might want at your side in sticky situations. For instance, Walter writes about a river crossing that the small group is making on their very first day of travel. Our first day out, we had to ford the Canadian River, known for its treacherous quicksand bottom. It had been forded only a few days before we got there, for the first time this spring. We looked it over carefully and could see fresh wagon tracks down to the water. My rig was in the lead and made a good quick crossing and pulled up the steep muddy bank on the far side. Frank came after me, and when he hit the bank, Mr. Vineyard drove in. But Frank's team could not pull the steep bank and let the hind wheels run back into the water. They began to settle at once. Mr. Vineyard laid the whip to his mules and managed to drive around Frank and pull up on the level. He took his mules loose from his wagon, rushed back, and hooked onto Frank's wagon tongue and hauled him to safety. Barry Vineyard was not just traveling west as a single man. He's doing all of this as a recent widower with four children, a 17-year-old daughter and three other children under the age of 10. His youngest daughters are seen here in this portrait, Molly and Cynthia, taken about two years after their journey west. Vineyard and his company had in originally intended to travel as far as Oregon, but he initially stopped off and settled for a few years in Idaho, and later moved on to live in Josephine County, Oregon. At some point, shortly before his eventual death in 1902, he's in poor health and moves to the Coos Bay area to live with his daughter Allie. She's the daughter who was 17 on the wagon trip west and later married Walter Weaver, our all-important memoirist. Barry comes to live in Marshfield, and that will be where he dies in, at the age of 58 in 1902. We know that Barry died of erysipelas, which is a bacterial infection of the skin and was particularly common among poultry farmers or others in close proximity to animals which makes perfect sense from what we know of Barry's occupation and history. Aerosyphilis can be a recurring condition, aggravated by ill health or other contributing factors, but not necessarily deadly today with antibiotic treatment. Unfortunately for Barry Vineyard, that was not the case in 1902. The three people we've met thus far have all had clearly identifiable gravestones in the Marshfield Pioneer Cemetery, although they all need a little bit of work to ensure their preservation for future generations. Some markers have not stood the test of time nearly so well, making it nearly impossible to identify the deceased. Thankfully, our work today can be informed by the research of past cemetery enthusiasts, like Alice Woolridge. In the 1960s, Alice Woolridge did a lot of research on cemeteries in Coos and Curry County. She went around and located small, semi-forgotten cemeteries. She compiled data about grave markers, and in the case of the Marshfield Pioneer Cemetery, she transcribed nearly all the gravestones still visible and readable at the time. 
As an interesting parenthetical, you may be familiar with Oregon historian Stephen Dow Beckham, a Cuspe native, professor emeritus from Lewis and Clark College, and author of a number of local history books. He actually worked on this transcription project in the summer of 1962 while a college student. Looking at the compilation of Woolridge's work from the 1960s, we can see that the gravestone that we just saw was much more intact 60 years ago. The complete inscription, although still not in English, can give us a few more insights and gives us a great starting point for looking in local newspapers. From the Coos Bay Times in March of 1909, we find more details about this tragic accident. The 10-year-old son of Andrew Yadzenkinus, who was killed yesterday afternoon by falling from a handcar on which he and some other boys were playing. Details of the accident are lacking, but it is thought that he was struck on the head by the handle of the car and thrown off. For untimely, accidental deaths like this one, inquests can be a wealth of information. Inquests are a relatively rare phenomenon today, but were quite common in the Coos Bay region in the late 1800s and early 1900s. If you died under mysterious, unknown, or questionable circumstances, the coroner would convene an inquest to gather information and determine the details of the case. On this page from Joseph's inquest, we see that the jury was interviewing all the other boys that he was playing with, asking them questions. Was the car locked? Was there someone that gave you permission? Did you see any adults around? Ultimately, they were trying to establish if someone was negligent or at fault for Joseph's death, or if it really was just a tragic accident. On the final page of the inquest, we have their verdict. We, the undersigned jurors, sworn to inquire of the death of Joseph Yudzenkinis, on oath do find that he came to his death by a fractured skull while riding upon a handcar, and that no blame is attachable to anyone, and his death was due to an accident. According to the boy's account, they had been pumping the handcar, and the handle was moving vigorously up and down, when Joseph reached down to grab his coat, and his head got caught under the moving handle. Joseph's story highlights an all-too-common fact of life in the early 20th century. Many children died from what are today preventable diseases or accidents. For the Yazenkinis family, the tragedy continued on after their son's death. Eleven months later, his mother passed away from heart trouble. Joseph's death was obviously still very present in the minds of the family and the local community because there, right in her obituary, they mentioned that her young son was killed in an accident last year. Like the Lattes, the Yazenkinises were another immigrant family who were not native English speakers. Historical records, which can always be fallible, can be particularly inaccurate in these types of cases. For instance, we see in the cemetery's records that Joseph's mother is listed as Martha Yudzenkinis. To add to the confusion, the same woman is then identified as Annie Yudzenkinis on her death certificate. Regardless of her preferred first name, the death certificate can also provide a bit of a clue as to the family's ethnicity and the language used on Joseph's grave marker. Both of Joseph's parents are listed as being from Russia. However, at the time, the Russian Empire included a lot of regions that are autonomous countries today, such as Lithuania. Based on the fact that their son's gravestone inscription was in Lithuanian, it's probably safe to assume that they are immigrants from that region of the Baltic and only nominally Russian. The ethnicity of the Yazenkinis family is a perfect case in point regarding the evolution of research on individuals buried in the cemetery. From a sizable amount of research and data crunching, we've identified 22 different countries from which people hailed. However, changing borders and political climates in 19th century Europe can make it difficult to be accurate. Should it be Prussia or Germany, Russia or Lithuania, Turkey or Greece? Some of our signage at the cemetery may become obsolete as we learn more, but it is all essential to gaining a deeper understanding of the many individuals interred there. While we've now heard about a number of people who deliberately chose to settle in the Coos Bay region, the cemetery is also the final resting place for some people who had only planned to visit temporarily. 
but their plans were derailed with their untimely deaths. In 1913, English-born Elizabeth Barrow came to Marshfield to visit relatives. Just short of her destination on her long journey from England, she passed away from heart trouble. In a similar vein to poor Mrs. Yezenkinus, there seems to have been a lot of confusion over everyone's name. While Elizabeth Barrow's gravestone identified her as the wife of Joseph Barrow, the newspaper reporting on her death called her Mrs. Thomas Barrows. Elizabeth died in the last stage of a long journey that had brought her by ship from England to New York, by train across the U.S., and then from Portland to Marshfield on the steamer Breakwater. Apparently, she had a heart attack and died right about the time the steamer was passing the Tillamook area. Fifty-plus years earlier, when Calvin West had died on a ship, he was immediately buried at sea. However, in the case of Elizabeth Barrow, there was no concern of contagion. She didn't have cholera like Calvin, and the steamer was also much closer to its destination, making it feasible to bring her body to Marshfield for burial. If we want to know more about Elizabeth's life prior to her arrival on Coos Bay, we have to look at international records, like the Census of England and Wales from 1911. Here we see Joseph Barrow and his wife, who, continuing the name confusion, is listed as Mary Jane, although we know this is the woman later buried as Elizabeth Barrow. In 1911, Joseph was working as a coal miner, and their daughter Mabel, who also travels with them to Oregon in 1913, was working as a warehouse girl for a pottery company. Even in the early 1900s, the federal government kept quite good records of arrival at major U.S. ports, tracking both immigrants seeking permanent residency and temporary visitors. When the SS Carmania arrived in New York on February 2, 1913, key information was recorded about the Barrows family. This included the fact that their passage from England was paid by Elizabeth Barrow's aunt, the family had $100 in their possession, and that they were traveling to visit Elizabeth's aunt, Mrs. A. Vernon of Marshfield, Oregon. Elizabeth's Aunt Anne will later be buried in the Marshfield Pioneer Cemetery as well. There's also an interesting end to the story for the rest of Elizabeth's family. Her daughter, Mabel, decided to stay in the U.S., and gets married to a local man a few years after their arrival. But after two years in Marshfield, Elizabeth's widower, Joseph, decides to go back home to England, sailing on the Lusitania from New York in February of 1915. Three months later, the Lusitania is sunk by a German U-boat, and there are over 1,000 casualties. When news reaches Coos Bay of the sinking of the Lusitania, it's of particular local interest because so many area residents knew Joseph Barrow and that he'd only just returned to England on the same ship. For the sixth and final person we look at, I want to end with someone a bit different, someone who was actually quite well known during his lifetime and who had a big impact on the area and the cemetery specifically, but who has been largely forgotten today. Charles Patterson was born in Canada in 1854 and died in Marshville in 1903. He left his home province of Ontario and traveled to Massachusetts as a teenager, where he studied stone cutting, learning to carve grave markers, and work with marble. Like so many others that we've heard about, he comes west as an adult, first spending some time in San Francisco, then in eastern Oregon working as a sheep farmer, then in Ashland and Roseburg, before eventually arriving in Marshfield in about 1890. He finally begins to put down roots, marries a local girl from a prominent Marshfield family, and becomes the proprietor of the Marshfield Marble Works. In 1891, we see that C.W. Patterson of the Marshfield Marble Works has been busy for some time past, dressing stone to include cemetery lots for Mrs. Nasberg and also for Lyman Noble. At present, he is putting in two beautiful marble fireplaces and mantles in P.C. Durgan's new residence. Mr. Patterson also has the contract for putting in a stone walk in front of W.G. Webster's brick store, which he will commence in a short time. This article is talking specifically about the Nasberg plot in the Marshall Pioneer Cemetery and the sandstone curbing that still encloses the plot to this very day. It makes perfect sense that C.W. Patterson was hired to do the work at this time. 
the article dates from October of 1891, just a few months after Mrs. Nasberg's husband and the family patriarch had died in June of that same year. The second person mentioned in the article, Lyman Noble, also had a death in the family that same year. His 12-year-old daughter, Maud, had died in February. So while C.W. Patterson didn't generally sign his work, we do have two specific examples of items he produced for the cemetery. And it's safe to say that he carved many of the early gravestones in the region. Local residents did have multiple options for purchasing gravestones. You could actually purchase gravestones from companies in the eastern United States and have them shipped by sea all the way to Oregon, but that would have been much more expensive and more time-consuming than having something made locally. C.W. Patterson dies quite young. He's only 49 when he dies in 1903. His obituary is a bit more detailed than some of the others we've seen, pointing to his position as an important local citizen. He left behind two young children and a wife, and his one son, Thomas, along with his wife, Ida, were later interred alongside him in the cemetery, where they all share the same joint headstone. C.W. Patterson is a fitting person to end with because of the direct impact he had on shaping the built environment of the cemetery. And also, if I may editorialize a bit, it seems likely that he'd be saddened by all the vandalism and weathering that the cemetery's monuments have suffered over the years. By the 1920s, as mentioned earlier in our overview of the cemetery, most of the plots had been sold, and the Odd Fellows established Sunset Memorial Park to serve the burial needs of a new generation of local residents. When someone bought a plot in the Marshfield Pioneer Cemetery in the 1880s or 1890s, there was no assurance of perpetual care. The idea of paying to ensure that your gravesite was looked after in perpetuity was an idea still in its infancy and not something that it would have seemed necessary to most Coos Bay region residents. There was a strong tradition of community-supported cemeteries in rural America, your family and your descendants would care for your grave, with other local residents pitching in as needed. At one point, having a tidy and well-maintained local cemetery was something to be lauded, something that was a credit to small communities. Unfortunately for the Marshfield Pioneer Cemetery, its decline in active usage corresponded with changing ideas about cemetery care, increased generational migration and movement, and a spate of vandalism. This 1926 article, Decrying Vandalism Committed in the Cemetery by Boys, was by no means unique. The cemetery's close proximity to the high school would be a challenge for both parties for decades. Uneducated or uncaring students have caused serious damage to the gravestones as recently as 2007, while the school once viewed the cemetery as an attractive nuisance and waste of prime real estate. It's unfair and untrue to ascribe all the blame about the gravestone's current condition to the nearby high school students. Deferred maintenance, natural weathering, and accidental damage has also taken a toll. But regardless of the causes, one thing is very true. About one-third of the Marshall Pioneer Cemetery's 1,100 gravestones are in need of preservation to ensure that they are preserved and protected for generations to come. In the six people I've highlighted today, we've seen gravestones in need of a variety of different types of repair. Some have simply become detached from their bases as old mortar crumbles. Others are broken and in need of more intensive care. Marianne Cottle, for instance, has this small, beautiful marble stone that is still feasible to repair, but only right now because of the three broken pieces have all survived. The cemetery also has a long legacy of well-intentioned care that sometimes did more harm than good. Right since the 1920s, outrage over the overgrown state of the cemetery and the damage to the monuments has prompted periodic re-engagement and involvement by volunteer groups and community members. In the 1960s and 1970s, this laudable impulse to improve the condition of the cemetery resulted in a lot of ill-advised repair work. Here, we see the messy remnants of one repair which was done incorrectly and with inappropriate materials and has subsequently failed again at the same breakpoint. I'd like to conclude on a much more positive note by sharing a bit of information 
about the cemetery's exciting new preservation initiative. In December of 2022, the city of Coos Bay received a $15,000 Certified Local Government Historic Preservation Grant. In January, the cemetery was awarded an additional $5,000 from the Three Rivers Foundation. These two grants are just the beginning of the multi-phase preservation project, Partners to Preserve Our Pioneer Cemetery. This work will be possible through an assortment of small grants, donations from descendants of those buried in the cemetery, and local support, and phase one of the project will be preserving the 101 most critically endangered at-risk gravestones in the cemetery, including all six people I highlighted today. Phase one will cost approximately $28,000, and as of early February 2023, we only need an additional 5800 to reach our goal. All funds will go direct to gravestone preservation, and all project work will be done by the Oregon Cultural Resource Management Firm of Historic Preservation Northwest, which specializes in historic cemetery work. All of the work, which will begin in late spring of 2023, will meet the Secretary of the Interior's standards for historic preservation, a much different level of preservation than that of the repairs attempted in the past. None of this will be achievable without the support of the local community and the cemetery's many stakeholders. We need your help whether that's making a donation, volunteering at a community work day, adopting a plot to care for long-term, or just by being a friend and advocate for the cemetery, sharing the news of partners to preserve our pioneer cemetery.